flow. We're not just building concierge luxury amenities. We're building real collar infrastructure that you're actually going to use. If you live in a, you know, in a, in a nice luxury condo in Manhattan, you probably have access to a bike room. If you live, if you work at Google, you probably have access to a bike room. But most New Yorkers don't live in luxury condos. Most New Yorkers don't work for Google. If you live in Crown Heights, where I live, or East New York, you probably live in an old pre-war building um, that doesn't have a bike room. Um, you don't have access to safe, secure bike parking. You live in a brown zone. You have to carry your bike up the stairs. You got to sleep next to your bike. Um, that's not going to be something that is um, realistic for you. And so, the conversation about cycling is as much about race and class and privilege um, as is the conversation uh, about you know policing, or as is the conversation about incarceration. Transportation is the next issue that intersects with every other issue. We have to get increasingly comfortable talking about you know all the interconnection points um, that that we touch. Hi everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John and that was Shabazz Stewart with Uni, an innovative secure bike parking solution born in New York City and starting to roll out to other cities as well. But before we dive into that conversation, I just wanted to say thank you so very much for tuning in. I produce this content in the hope that I can help inspire and support others, perhaps you, to take up the cause to create and promote a culture of activity for all ages and abilities in your communities. Having you here means the world to me. And yes, it's always wonderful to have you along for the ride. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Shabazz Stewart. I am absolutely so delighted to welcome onto the podcast Shabazz Stewart from the New York City area. Shabazz, how are you, sir? I'm great. You know, I'm enjoying my my holiday season. Um, you know, second holiday here in New York with uh, besieged by COVID, so I'm making the best of it. Um, it's a really exciting time here locally. We've got new leadership coming in. We've got um, for the first time, you know, we're able to have um, we're able to have a holistic conversation about um, infrastructure, about pedestrian safety, um, about re-envisioning and reimagining mobility, um, regionally speaking. You know, this year for UNI, um, you know, will mark the beginning of a sort of the most ambitious bike infrastructure project um, in, in the country with 40 secure bike parking stations, um, you know, being built um, across the region. So um, it's something that we're really excited about. Um, we... Um, you know, I really can't wait to, to, to get to get started. Fantastic. Well, you you mentioned the name there uh, uh, just briefly. So uh, let's have you uh, kind of go back to the beginning and and talk a little bit about uh, Uni, what it is and how you became passionate about this topic. Well, I, you know, to be honest with you, I'm a I'm a pretty straight laced guy. So I've been passionate about public transportation um, since I was four years old. Um, I grew up in Brooklyn where I still live. Um, you know, my mom did not drive. She's never driven in, in, in America. She's from Barbados, um, and drove there, just didn't, didn't cross over here. Um, you know, so I grew up riding subways and buses, right. In, in New York and, um, you know, learn to bike like many Americans do in the park. Um, I went to college, um, you know, realized the first time at the age of, of 21 that, Cycling could not just be a mode of recreation, but it could also be a viable mode of transportation. Um, brought that back here to New York um, and then started to wonder why, you know, cycling, which was growing in prevalence, did not offer the kind of um, holistic sort of seamless experience that we came to expect from um, driving from cars, um, from, from, from ride share, but also from public transit, from mass transit, Right. Uh, using your bike and scooter now was um, like the Wild West. Uh, secure bike park and the lack thereof, for me, um, was the biggest pain point. Now, I think people forget when you ask advocates, hey, you know, name the big issue that prevents people from riding. Um, safety almost always is at the tip of the tongue. But actually, for many cyclists who already bike, right, if, if you just subset out the people who um, are not biking, you know, remove those folks and just focus on the people who already are biking, people who are already comfortable um, with the safety element to an extent. Um, their biggest issue is often the lack of secure parking. Here in New York, that demographic is not insignificant. We've got 1.1 million people or so who've, um, 
ridden a bike, you know, at least three times in the past month. So we've got a large group of people in, 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 in our localities that are regular cyclists. Why aren't they taking more trips? How can we get those three trips per month to 25 trips per month? Well, we've got to make cycling not just safe, but also reliable, convenient, and fast. Uh, and if someone buys a new e-bike, we're up you know, exponentially in e-bike sales over the past two years. Someone invests in a new scooter or they invest in a new road bike. They're not going to use that new device if they're convinced that it could be stolen or taken from them or vandalized um, by... Um, you know, by uh, just basically going through a, a matter of, of just regular commuting, regular, you know, trips, et cetera. So um, it's something that, um, that has to be solved if we're going to develop cycling as a mode of transportation um, um, going forward on a regular basis, um, especially if we're going to really get to a place where we're one out of every – um, for urban trips, which is what cities like New York want to get to. Fantastic. And uh, to infuse a little bit of a visual here, I have uh, one of the photos uh, of, of the Onipod, uh, you know, up on screen here. Why don't you explain what it is we're looking at right here? Um, so the idea behind Uni was uh, to create a system um, where secure bike parking infrastructure could thrive in city. So, you know, I think traditionally we've looked at bike parking as um, something that we kind of have to put up with. Um, you know, we hear terms like bike locker, bike box, bike shed, bike garage. Um, and those are things that people don't want in marquee urban centers. You know, the last thing you want to have in your nice new public plaza or next to your real estate development is a bike box. Um, you don't want to have, you know, a garage or a hangar. Um, and so can we envision infrastructure that is not going to kind of hide away in a parking lot or sulk, you know, in the shadows or, or lurk next to the train tracks, but something that could be um, as marquee as a bus shelter or a newsstand? Um, you know, we went to, um, you know, we went to advocates and city officials and, and some private companies back in 2016 and said, look, we've got this idea. We've got something that we think is going to be viable. It's got to be automated. It's got to, uh, you know, copy and emulate the network of bike share. Bike share in New York has been tremendously successful, uh, but we're convinced it can work and it can align with the city's stated priorities for mobility, right? Um, and we're basically laughed out of the room. <laughs> People said, "Okay, good luck." You know, uh, you know, uh, California is for dreamers. This is in New York, right? Like this is something that, it, 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 you know, it's a rendering. It's not going to work. There are too many challenges. Um, who's going to take care of it and maintain it. Um, I used to work for a business improvement district. I was the deputy director of operations for the downtown Brooklyn partnership. And um, in my heart, I knew that um, it could be successful. This model worked in some of the nation's most challenging urban environments. And so my partner and I went out, set out to just kind of go do it. At first, just to prove baseline efficacy. Um, but eventually, you know, as we launched stations, um, you know, one, two, and three, basically to scale this, um, you know, not just in New York, but in cities across the country, like, like bike share, um, we have an opportunity to pair design with smart business, um, with smart operational know-how, um, and with 21st century innovation. Um, and good governance and grassroots organizing and progressive values and to leverage all of those um, to change urban living for the best, right? One out of every um, five car trips in New York is under one mile. One out of every two car trips is under three miles. So if we can think about how we can migrate those trips over to um, non-vehicular modes of transportation, particularly not private vehicular modes of transportation. We can make life better and easier for everybody. So let's start with drivers. You know, if you're going three miles or above, life is easier for you. Let's say that you are a pedestrian. We've got less cars in the street. Life is easier for you. 
you know, you're a cyclist, your life is easier for you. You can, you can bike sit more, you know, more safely. Um, but also if you're just calling emergency services, uh, you, you know, your friend's choking on something, your, 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 your family was having, you know, a cardiac arrest moment. Those can get to you faster now because we've got less traffic, less congestion. We can cut down on emissions. We can optimize our society, our cities for a climate change future. You know, transport is the biggest source globally of CO2 emissions and private vehicles account for 60% of that. So, you know, it's getting to a place where we're optimized for the future starts with investing in this kind of infrastructure. And UNI is about figuring out a way to do that. And I'm going to end by saying our goal is not to build one or two. Our goal is to build thousands in cities across the world. So thinking about how do we scale this as a system? Yeah. And the mini obviously is, is part of that because that also has a smaller footprint, uh, basically right. about the size of, a, of, of an automobile parking spot. So the reason why I stress that Uni is not about building designs, right? We're not a design company. We're not a box company. We are an operator. So if you think about, um, you know, icon parking, you think about, you know, um, motivate, we're much more like those companies or which we aspire to be than we are, you know, a company that makes des cool designs. So in order to operationalize a secure bike parking system, we need to have a range of designs that can be suitable for different contexts, right? So we need to have a way that we can um, appropriate, spa appropriate space on the curb, right? And here in New York, we've got about 3 million plus free on-street curbside parking spaces. We need to have a solution for those spaces. We need to have a solution for large public plazas, wide sidewalks, where we can have medium density. And we need to have a solution for in buildings, you know, where you can have, you know, 100, 200, 300 spaces. And all of those dynamics together, design um, sort of idioms can, can work together to create a system that is suitable, not just for everybody, but also for a variety of neighborhood settings, right? You know, here in New York, what works in Park Slope is not necessarily going to be appropriate for Midtown Manhattan. And we need to have a design ethos that recognizes that no streetscape is like any other streetscape. And so the Mini was really about, you know, trying to understand what could allow a curbside, um, you know, a curbside module to, to, to thrive and save. And that emphasize that word thrive for a second. You know, so much of, of, of this market before Uni existed was creating um, sort of like what I would call um, draconian rudimentary infrastructure that was really aimed to be you know, at, at the lowest price point. And that's because it was vendors not seeking to operate, but to sell, you know, cheap designs um, to, you know, cities that would install them and people kind of put up with them, right? And so you see even these names, again, bike barn or bike box or bike locker. Or the idea was this is something you're going to put up with and it's going to like be securitized and it's going to be cheap, right? As a result, you know, we are, we're forfeiting all these opportunities. No one wants a bike locker in the middle of Times Square. No one wants to ship a container by the Barclays Center. No one wants to have a barn, at, you know, at Rockefeller Center or Rodeo Drive, right? Or by the White House. That's not where a barn is going to go, right? But if we think about um, what would a an asset that looked better than the cars that we've become used to? What would that look like? That the Uni Mini is a prototype for that kind of future, and the response has been really tremendous. I think people can really see, hey, I could have this on my block. Um, my partner is an architect, and he designed New York City's first pedestrian plaza, New York City's model for parklets, um, and so he has a ton of experience in appropriating um, these kinds of infrastructures for cities. And I think we're seeing um, the legacy of that know-how right now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I could imagine at some point in time where, you know, a, a, you know, a, a borough like, you know, Brooklyn, I mean, you could have one of these minis on, you know, basically one every block. <laughs> I mean, just uh, yeah, imagine. Look, I mean, yeah, so, so... Part of our work in, in, in being an operator is to work with cities and to not shy away from the political process 
of, of land use, because land use is always political. We can't pretend that we're going to have an apolitical land use conversation. So work with cities, um, work with advocates, work with communities to um, justify, explain, advocate for, and execute on um, our vision for this new generation of infrastructure. And so um, we, we did just that in Jersey City, where we've got the nation's first secure bike parking contract you know, for a big city. Never before has a city said, we want all of our residents to have access to on-street secure bike parking stations. Um, we're hoping to do that here in New York. We've got new leadership coming in. Um, it, it should not be lost on people that the incoming mayor cut the ribbon um, you know, on the Uni Mini, uh, parked the first bike in the Uni Mini, and on the first you know, Uni Pod in Brooklyn. Um, you know, and, and we're hoping to do this in cities across the country. But you know, where we've, where we've um, failed, to be frank, collectively as a community is not thinking on scale, right? We, we think about, hey, can we get some bike lockers at the, the metro train station over here? But, you know, that's not how transportation systems work, right? We have to start with saying, how much capacity do we need regionally? Um, what is going to be the role of the system? You know, are we going to complement um, other offerings? There, you know, I, I happen to think that from a planning perspective, a vast majority of bicycle parking is going to be offered within the confines of, of existing buildings that are going to offer it to the residents and the tenants. But let's say 25% of all cycling parking needs are going to be offered are going to be public. That's significant. And that 25% can catalyze growth in other parts uh, of the landscape. So there's a really strong role for the public to play. We just have to think about, you know, systems and scale, right? And when you start to think about those questions, you get to a whole, um, you know, whole array of other secondary, tertiary questions that um, you know you have to grapple with. And I can, uh, you know, I don't want to bore the audience, but there, there are a lot of those that people might not um, expect. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that I, in fact, I think what I, I'd like to do is um, Clarence with Street Films uh, put together a, a nice little video for you about uh, two years ago, um, and I it was think exactly it'd be, two years ago. Yeah, it was exactly two years ago. Yeah. Yep. So uh, I think it'd be cool to to cue that up and and play that because it's not very long, and I think it'll also give the audience uh, who who it'll bring this this to life. And uh, if at any point in time you want to interject and 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 say something, just you know jump right in there, and I'll bring the volume down and press and press pause on it, so we can actually you know sort of comment as we go because there there may be things in there that. Uh, that you want to interject and, and say something about. So let's let's cue this uh, up and, and have some fun with it. <laughs> okay, there you are. <laughs> we are in Brooklyn. Uh, we are across the street from the Barclays Center at Atlantic Terminal, and this is Uni. This is the first installation in Brooklyn, the first permanent installation in New York City it can have 20 bikes at a time. 20 bikes at a time means it can service about 150 people a day. Um, this is a mall where people come in, they park their bikes, they go shopping for an hour or two, they leave. It's a transportation hub. Across from the Barclays Center to have a space where you can put your bikes, get on the train, or go to the game. That is the mindset we want to employ in this city. You know, we're standing here today on a rainy mid-December day. Shabazz has been working on this for years and years and years. And New York City is great because we're a city of innovators and entrepreneurs and people that keep pushing forward. Coming from my artistic vantage point is this is really actually very beautiful and it's designed very well and it's very attractive. This is really going to give uh, the dignity and the safety as well as the beauty to a form of transportation that's been long neglected um, throughout our cities. We have a unit that's doing uh, extremely well in Journal Square in partnership with the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. It actually has exceeded our capacity expectations. We've got about 200 people signed up to use it on a regular basis. The week after it opened we saw the, the pod fill up to its capacity. You can use your card or a smartphone app to open the door. And then you go inside, we have vertical racks um, and we have 20 spots. You can park your bike, your scooter, your e-bike. We're really here to serve everybody. I had bought my bike over the summer because of this place. Uh, I commute into uh, World Trade Center via the path and I never really wanted to 
buy a bike because I was always worried it was gonna get stolen. And then when this came up, I was like, okay, okay, this is cool. I'm gonna get a bike now. Cuts my commute time in half. I might do a late show stay at my partners in the city and I don't wanna worry about my bike being stolen, but here it's, it's insured. And it's also just, it's shelter from the elements and it's just a better experience. As a person that rides a scooter, uh, having a safe place to- I wanna, I wanna interject here for a second actually, because so, so Vince, um, you know, was not, was a skeptic. Uh, and we first met on Twitter and he, you know, is a long time community member, works down the street and kind of said, why is this thing going here? And this is when we were under, it was under construction. What is this thing? Why is it going here? Why is it taking up so much space? And, you know, we, we got into um, a lively Twitter discussion and it was just clear that, um, he was not going to have any of it. <laughs> you know, we were not, we were not moving him. Um, and my reaction, you know, was let me come see you. Can I come see you and, and talk to you? And he was like, sure, whatever. And so I, I, I came to see him and, you know, we, we had a conversation um, that was two hours long and I kind of explained, you know, who we were, what we we're trying to do. And he explained, you know, what his concerns were. And we talked about the future of the project, you know, how we would work to incorporate his concerns. This is a prototype, it's a pilot, you know, we're going to incorporate your concerns, um, you, you know, going forward and this is, we're gonna include you in the process. Um, and he became one of our biggest supporters. He was at our launch event. He obviously did this video with us. He's, he's testified in public on our behalf. Um, and, and I think, this is something that we often miss about the importance of community engagement as it relates to um, new types of infrastructure programs. Um, you, you know, so much of, we need to be having proactive conversations with members of the community um, and explaining to folks why we are credible, why what we're doing works for them. And oftentimes, you know, I think advocates and people in the private sector just kind of bake in the community opposition. Oh, the communities are going to hate you. They're they're going to you know they're not going to. But oftentimes the communities are reacting um, to a bundle of concerns, right? Concern one, you know, we are stakeholders in the space. We've been left out of the process. No one even asked us. We thought you're coming in, telling us they're going to do this. Um, two, do we trust you? Like you guys are some Silicon Valley venture capitalists coming in. You're going to you know drop this thing in here, you're gonna walk away. Three, do we believe in the solution? Do we believe that this is something that can be efficacious, right? Um, when you're able to have a rational conversation with people and explain to people you know, how you thought through all of these challenges and most importantly that you respect them and that you're there to listen to them and that you're taking the time out of your schedule to talk to them, you know, people, people change, their, their attitudes change. You know, we go from you know, I have some concerns. Too. I really like you, and I want you to succeed. We go from I hate this to this isn't so bad, maybe, and I'm going to begrudgingly think that you know I'll put up with it, right? But that's that's progress. We can soften opposition, and we can create you know create enthusiasm by just talking to people. So part of the Uni model is not just taking on you know the financing, the design, the operation. It's also taking on the community outreach engagement. You know, we had. You know, early on, people said, Shabazz, this advertising-based model is, is going to be, you know, DOA, right? Like, and, you know, we've got Community Board 4 wrote a letter to City Hall. Community Board 4 is in Hell's Kitchen. Um, they're in the west of Manhattan. They're one of Manhattan's more conservative community boards when it comes to land use preservation. And they wrote a letter that said, by unanimous consent, we want secure bike parking, and we are okay with advertising to pay for it, right? Um, because you know, we, Uni was showing that, hey, we can unite a real business model that scales with progressive grassroots-based politics. Um, I will say that the big challenge of our time, and I really believe this is not just me kind of pontificating, the big challenge of our time is rising to the moment to meet, you know, the existential risks of the 21st century, the least, Sorry, the least, not the least of which is climate change. And can we find a way to, you know, unite the vast resources of our society? We're the richest society, globally speaking, that we, I think, in the history of, of human civilization, right? No society globally has ever had more, right, at their disposal. Intellectual capital, capital, 
can we unite those resources with the will, the know-how to solve the great problems at hand? And in order for that to happen, we have to figure out how to take American-style capitalism and appropriate it to address real issues. You know, we created UNI, the whiteboard, as a policy solution, and the business model came to support that after. And we believe that, that model can really work. And part of our work is saying no to this current sort of like spray and pray, scale it all risk, venture capital model that takes sometimes, um, you know, charitably takes non-impactful ideas, uncharitably takes dumb ideas and, you know, says, Let, why don't we grow that and we'll hire some lobbyists and we'll hire some advocates and we'll try to justify it by saying, yeah, there's a little impact here. We'll put up, no, 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 no. We can have real impact that works and we can also have a responsible scale model that you know, creates value for civic shareholders. Yeah, yeah. You had mentioned, uh, you know, venture capital and you just mentioned civic shareholders right there. Uh, you all have have just gone out and and raised uh, some money so that you can scale this up and move it along. Talk, talk a little bit about that experience. Yeah, you know, we are um, on Republic, which is a um, crowd investing platform. Um, we we, you know. We're very close to our goal of a of million dollars, uh, only after a month. So it was a little bit of uh, shock and awe and surprise from those who've watched us for a while. I've been saying to folks that, hey, you know, there's a movement here. We're building a grassroots movement to support green infrastructure across the country. And if Bernie Sanders can raise, you know, fifty million dollars in a quarter, right, or a month um, on small dollar donations from people who um, want to see change in their communities. Why can't a civic idea raise $1 million or $5 million from civic investors to invest and to, to scale up real efficacious proven infrastructure um, with, with a compelling business model? And people kind of said, okay, sure, whatever, Shabazz, but we're very close um, in a very short period of time uh, to validating that approach. Um, for us, you know, we're not saying no to, by no means are we saying no to institutional investors and traditional venture capital. What we are saying, though, is that increasingly it's going to be really important for um, small dollar investors, what we call civic investors, um, people who frankly are more used to making donations um, to, 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 to charities to play a role in how companies like ours collect and secure and uh, leverage capital. Um, you know, when we're talking to cities and we're talking to local officials, hey, you know, your communities are literally invested in this. Um, when we're talking about a political action network, hey, you know, people across the country are invested in this. They have skin in the game. Um, when we're talking about the decisions we make collectively as a company, you know, our shareholders, people who are putting their money where their mouth is, people who are helping us build this vision, you know, our investors are interested in a double bottom line, a true double bottom line, not one in name only, where we are scaling responsibly, we're growing responsibly, we're producing um, returns responsibly, but we're also committed and advocating for and executing on a real vision for social change. Um, and so Republic and Republic's a crowd investing platform, again, um, you know, has been really critical to that vision. We've got at this point, almost 800 individual micro civic investors. Um, and that's, you know, we've taken that to venture capital conversations and, you know, heads are turning because people are like, wow, people, citizens, constituents, consumers really care about this. And, you know, maybe we should, maybe we should too. Yeah. Yeah. It's good stuff. I'm going to scroll. This is your, uh, your webpage here that I've with, that we've landed on here. I'm just going to kind of scroll just a little bit. So, so, so folks can get a little bit of a more visual. Full disclosure, kind of our website right now is, is part of the reason we're raising money is, is to, you know, overhaul, uh, look, so, so Uni is not a, it, it, it's a scrappy operation and we are the process now of really sort of, for lack of a better term, professionalizing the company. Right. Um, our vision is to have things like an office, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and a staff. Right. We, we for most of my sister, it was just me and one other person on, on a day to day basis. And so 
you only raise um, about $900,000 over three and a half years, which sounds like a lot until you realize that building infrastructure, maintaining infrastructure is the most capital intensive thing you can do. Um, and, you know, so three and a half years under a million dollars is not, it will never be confused with, with Uber or Lyft or, or Bird or Lime. Um, and our website, you know, you can look at our, our, our marketing collateral and how we do business and it, it, it bears it out. You know, we are in what we call an industry, an MVP, a minimally viable product. The goal was to prove efficaciousness. And now that we've done that, you know, we're, we're, we're raising some, some real capital. Now we're on this journey to, to, to say, okay, let's build um, a, 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 a more um, leaner but still mean operation Will allow us to enter the second phase of growth, which is fulfilling um, and all the and all the momentum that we that we've seen come our way. Yeah, I'm pausing on this particular screen so that uh, we can uh, uh, explain the the name a little bit more too. So Uni is spelled O O N E E, and it's uh, it, it, you know it originates you know from the sea urchin, and uh, so for somebody who uh, lived in Hawaii for many many years and used to you know. Uh, mix it up with some of the sea urchins when I was out surfing in the in the reef there. Uh, you know, part of what you were saying is, you know, just like with a sea urchin uh, from which the name derives, Uni is equipped with safety features to protect the valuable cargo that's inside. And uh, a big part of, of I think the to to your point of why this is so critical to this big issue of encouraging more people to ride more often is that. A sense of of reliability and security that people will have for their uh, for their ride for their equipment. Um, all the more important with the pro proliferation of e bikes and more expensive uh, commuter bikes, you know, within within the um, the urban environment that's out there right now. Um, how does one secure their bike once it's inside uh, an Unipod? So right now, um, the vision is um, we're going to have a self-locking rack that is going to um, provide security in that last stage. Currently, um, what we are now, again, in MVP prototype phase of growth, we secure, you know, the user provides their own lock once inside. We provide insurance, we have video monitoring, but that, that, that final layer of security is provided by the user. Um, we haven't, until now, or until you know, presently in the near future, we haven't really had the resources to realize the full scope of the vision. Um, but now we're very close to doing that and we're very excited. Um, so in the future, in the near future, you won't need your own lock. You will have a lock um, that is uh, provided by the, the dock inside. Um, and, you know, you will um, be directed to a spot inside and you will be able to, um, that will be how your, your bike is secured. Fantastic. That's good. And um, I want to pull up uh, another page in your, your website here that, you know, really starts to look at this vision that you're talking about and uh, really exemplifying, I think, one of the best models that we have worldwide is the Dutch model of how convenient, uh, secure bike parking is so often available, especially at the, the, the main transit, uh, locations and the rail stations, um, you know, really, really important to be able to help support that. And so what you're really seeing here is that, especially in the last five years or so, riding a bike and scooters, you know, forms of micro mobility are much more common, are much more mainstream than a lot of people give them credit for, but you still have that problem of securing, uh, these valuable assets so that when you get out from your, whatever you're doing, whether it was at work or a meeting, uh, you, your, your, your valuable asset is still there waiting for you. Yeah. I mean, look, I think a better way to look at it is whatever valuable asset you own, you know, for me, I have a computer, I have a camera, I've got, um, you know, photo albums, I've got a few other things. Um, Whatever valuable assets that you own, um, would you feel comfortable leaving those assets on the street, um, unprotected, secured maybe by a thin piece of steel and just every night, right? No, or every or for eight hours every day. Um, you know, I don't think you would. I think that if we had a flat screen TV, 
say, yeah, hey, you want to leave outside? You know, it'll be fine. Let's put, let's put a little like, no, you wouldn't do that. It'd be absurd. But we're asking people to do that with their bikes, right? We're saying, hey, you know, you just invested $3,000 in an e-bike. This thing is going to, be, you know, something that you use to get around on a daily basis. Um, it's going to be something that is going to be, you know, it needs to be reliable for you. Um, how about you leave it outside? How about those outside, you know, unprotected, right? And, you know, there are different categories of consequences that are approached. Foremost is, um, look, I mean, let's say your bike doesn't get stolen. Let's say that, you know, someone just kicks the tires or they mess with the chains, right? Or they, you know, they, 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 they pour paint on it, right? You're not going to be able to use that bike to get home. You're, you're taking that bike to the bike shop. You're leaving it there, right? Um, but secondarily, what if it rains? What if it snows, right? Here in New York, you know, during Ida, we had, um, you know, bikes floating down the street, right? So um, the challenge is thinking about, hey, you know, if, if people are not able to, to be confident their bike will be there and be usable, when they will come back from a long stay trip, where it'd be work, home, or school, or somewhere else, um, why would people ever really consider using a bicycle or scooter as a primary means of transportation? Um, and it goes back to what I said in the first part of our conversation. Um, safety is necessary, but not sufficient for transportation competitiveness. No one here in New York rides a subway and said, it was safe today. The R train was really safe. No one, you know, flies on American or United or and says, "Oh, I felt really safe on my flight." The the airport was really safe, right? No one drives on the PCH or the 401, right? And says, "Or the 405." Oh, it was it was great, it was safe, right? You know, safety is that thing that has to be um, so present that it's unspoken, and then we've got a bundle of other concerns that we have to address. When your car breaks down, there's someone to call, right? There's a way that you can show the police officers and you can stop the car is yours, right? There are insurance plans. There are competitive leasing options, right? There are servicing plans when you, you get from the dealership. You know, there, there are things to do if your car gets stolen, right? There are all these things that make the car ownership experience um, complete, seamless, and relatively concierge. But with bicycles, we've got none of that, right? You are on your own. You can't even prove your bicycle belongs to you, <laughs> right? And so, you know, if we're thinking cogently about getting to a future where, you know, bikes are not just a nice niche, because that's where they are now. I and mean, we don't want to admit to ourselves, but across the country, you know, DOTs and transportation experts and advocates are still treating bikes like they're a nice niche. If you want to get beyond that to a place where bicycles are just as prevalent as cars in cities for trips, um, then we've got to think holistically about the bundle of experiences that come along with being on a bike or scooter. And bike parking um, is, is the leading one. I, I will add, uh, I'll close by saying that here in New York, I'm pretty sure this is true in other cities across the country, you cannot have a single conversation about land use without talking about car parking. You can't build a building. You can't talk about outdoor dining. It all goes back to car parking. How are we going to have a, a mode of transportation like bikes be, be prevalent without talking about bike parking? I don't know. Yeah. It's, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And, uh, you, you mentioned safety a, a few times there. And, and I think one of the most important aspects of that is that there has to be that baseline level of confidence that your journey is going to be a successful journey to your point from earlier too, is that, um, if we really truly want to get more people riding more often. Uh, yes, it's, it's some of those people who are confident enough to ride now, but it's also imp imperative that the cities, not just New York City, but cities around the globe, especially if we're going to be serious about, you know, climate change issue to be able to shift more and more of these shorter trip car journeys you know, over to other modes, uh, micro mobility modes needs to be safer. Uh, so, so tell us what is this bike NYC Twitter thing? <laughs> well, I, the bike NYC, uh, is, is a group of people who bike, who talk about 
you know, safe streets and, and cycling on Twitter, right? And, you know, I, 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 so I, I, I don't know how else to put it. Well, I'm, I'll, I'll interject and just uh, jump in and say, because I have this nice blank screen here all queued up, because y- you are a, a bike you know, you know, NYC Twitter superstar, according to Clarence anyways. So let's, let's, uh, let's, let's roll this real quick and have some fun with it. (laughs) Hi, my name is Shabazz Stewart. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. I've been riding in New York City for about 13 years now. And for my day job, I work for Uni. I try to bring secure, accessible, egalitarian bike parking to the New York, New Jersey area on scale. So a year ago, I was um, doored while riding my bike in New York City. And it was the scariest thing that has ever happened to me. Um, I was on the ground and I'm lucky to be alive. That's why collectively we need to recognize that strips of paint aren't real bicycle lines. They don't provide real protection. They don't keep people safe. Because two, three feet out is what we call the door zone. And people have to, if they're being experienced and they're smart, they have to ride outside the door zone. So there's only about a foot of clearance between the door zone and traffic. And if they're not experienced, they'll ride inside the door zone next to the parked cars. And they're only an open door away from being on the ground in front of a car, in front of a bus, on the road. And in addition to the door zones, we've got double parked cars that are littering the street. And this is important because cars that are traversing um, this passageway now have to themselves swerve into the bicycle lane to avoid double parked cars. And this creates sort of like a minefield bramble for people who are on bikes, right? You've got to now avoid the doors that are gonna fling open and you've got to avoid the cars that are swerving into the bike lanes. We should have loading zones. If the the enemy is not the delivery trucks, the enemy is all the parking. And behind me is a moving truck, and the moving truck is blocking the bike lane, and cyclists have to swerve into traffic uh, to avoid uh, hitting the moving truck. And you've got to look both ways for cyclists, for cars, so that they don't um, injure themselves or injure others. But here's the big thing that's worth I'm going to pause here just for for a second to to say that I thought that was a, a really good point that you you made that it 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 isn't necessarily the fault of the the delivery person who's doing this it's the infrastructure the way that it's done and this is where you actually do bring up the 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 quote about the amount of free curbside parking for private motor vehicles throughout the city and that expectation and then of course then you you get the you know the fallout from that it's like you know well people do have to move and you you people are receiving various deliveries of different types and you know that creates a an infrastructure challenge and it goes back to your point the you know from earlier is that it all boils down to parking and you know where's that balance and how are we going to create things uh and there's trade-offs um but being able to have a more intelligent approach to the land use of that right of way that we have and that curb space that we have is so incredibly important to be able to balance all the different um challenges and all the different desires and all the different uses that that we have out there including not creating door zone bike lanes yeah, I, you know, look, first of all, I was I was almost an English major and I, I've um, maintained my penchant for hyperbole um, since college and wherever I can employ it, I do. So Mindful Bramble is one of my, my more creative um, hyperbole. Uh, I know, had to um, get that one in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but look, I think one of the challenges of advocacy, there are several um, in, in this new age uh, as it comes to transportation and cycling. Um, one of the challenges that we have collectively is um, our ability or the need to be passionate, but also dispassionate. Um, We have to be relentless in our pursuit of holistic change and our rejection of um, incrementalism um, because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, But we also have to remember that when we eject emotion into these conversations, um, you know, people, um, all of us, we tend to retreat into um, our, our spaces, our tribes, 
and it becomes a conversation about who wins and who loses and it becomes personal. So, you know, here in New York, you know, there's a, there is a conversation that's happening about bikes and cars and land use. And it's, there's a, is a policy part of it, but there's also very much a personal part of it. And you can see that on Twitter where people are like, Oh, we caught the baz in a car today. Right. And, Oh, like, how dare you use your car to get from here to there? And how dare you, you know, you know, why are people who bike or they just want a whole city to be on bikes, right? And, you know, we're not able to have any semblance of nuance and say, okay, you know, car trips that are over three miles are not as bad as car trips are under one mile, right? We can make street. One of the best places to drive in the world is the Netherlands because there's so few cars in the street. Um, so we can, we can actually make life better for longer car trips, people who um, are going, you know, three, four, five, 10, 20 miles. Um, but also, hey, you know, not all motor vehicles are bad. Like we are going to, uh, or not all them are, these trips are errant. We're going to a future where people expect um, to order something from Amazon and expect it to be there the next day. And how can we create and justify that kind of economy where people have a supply chain that's effective uh, without having de- allowances for delivery zones. You know, we can't have, our streets are finite spaces and cities are all about finite real estate. So we can't have limitless car parking, um, bike lanes, bus lanes, uh, and delivery zones all on the same street. Someone has to go, right? And that's not a personal conversation. It's not me being mean. It's about creating priorities, right? And I think we increasingly need to say to people, you know, um, cars are not bad. You're not a pariah because you choose to drive. They're, they're trips that I drive, right? I don't have a license, but I use Uber and Lyft a few times a month when I'm going to the airport or if I'm going to, to move heavy items. Um, but we should treat penthouse transportation because that's what cars are in cities, um, like the penthouse. You, know, you can live in the penthouse, but you have to pay. And we rationalize um, space allocation in, in America by 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 charging who can pay um so when it comes to delivery zones um we have to have a conversation about you know what priorities are most important um for the kinds of spaces that we have available and i think you know delivery zones loading zones uh, are a crucial part of this of the urban future not just for um getting your package from amazon but the downstream impacts of safety for cyclists you know instead of that delivery truck being in the bike lane or the mobility lane, you know, having it be on the shoulder, the parking lane, is a better streetscape for everyone. The B45 bus, which is my new nemesis um, in Brooklyn, it spends half of its life stuck behind delivery trucks because St. John's, uh, where it operates mostly on, is a narrow Brooklyn street. You know, there are about 20,000 B45 bus riders that would love to have delivery zones, right? Uh, so it really is thinking about catalytic you know, investments in, 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 in infrastructure and interventions that can produce really compelling competitive results that can help us reimagine cities. Yeah. Yeah. And as you said, you know, earlier, uh, there is a sense of urgency. We do need to move things and get things going at scale, but at the same time, uh, you're in the business right now of, of creating this, you know, this viable product model to, to demonstrate the need as well as, you know, gain support and fans block by block, including the gentleman, uh, that you had referred to earlier on the scooter. I do want to add one thing. We talk about bike NYC and what's critical to our advocacy, and also, by the way, what's critical to our formula. You know, when I talked in the video uh, with Clarence, well, here I use the word egalitarian um, yeah. in describing your bike parking. Um, in order to think about our transition to 21st century green mobility, we got to talk about um, race and class in America. You know, the, the conversations that we're having, um, and I say this all due action for my brothers and sisters who are in the space and fighting these battles, for so many years that we are now benefiting from, um, but they're mostly white men, and what we have, what we have, um, we're now in a space where you know we're talking about gentrification and land use and, and communities. New York City's majority minority, you know, Atlanta majority black, right? Oakland, all these cities are are diverse spaces, and they're asking the question for who, 
who is this for? Is this for me? Like, how does this benefit me? No one's, no one who looks like me is speaking to me, right? I don't understand, like, you know, and, and given our culture and our, our past, um, is not a productive way to have this kind of conversation moving forward. Um, so we need to um, really think holistically about how we can talk about transportation and cycling, um, you know, as it relates to an increasingly diverse audience, so we can take the next step forward. Um, I think we've reached the ceiling, we've reached the peak of advocacy as far as, you know, what men will take us. Um, we need to have, and again, I say that not to be, I understand that that sounds to people like excessively woke, but, you know, New York City is a majority minority, but most of our advocacy organizations have only ever been led by white men. And, you know, when I go into my communities and I say, hey, have you ever heard of uh, X advocacy organization? I don't want to name names. They'll say, I've never heard of that. I don't know what that is. Um, I don't, uh, but, but you're on a bike, you know, I don't know what that is. We've got in New York City 65,000 delivery workers that, you know, are a majority minority. In fact, almost all minority, all working class, mostly immigrants. And it's very possible in New York City that, um, in fact, it's, it's almost, you know, it's, it's basically assured that the average cyclist is a minority. And the conversation has been colonized to reflect something else. And as a result, politically, when we go into, um, you know, city council members, the mayor's office, or, you know, agency head, you know, we say, look, you know, we need to think cogently about investing in the right kind of infrastructure um, to, to, to make lives for these folks safer. Why does this relate to me? You know, I'm in a district where people don't do that. Um, you know, the, the people who suffer from the lack of bike infrastructure the most are delivery workers uh, here in New York. They, they bear the brunt. We had, we had two die this weekend. Um, you know, so, so it, it really is important that we're able to speak representatively and to look like our audience. And so that, that means that, um, you know, it's what we've spoken about extensively with Uni. It, it means that we have to kind of, um, you know, broaden our horizons. Uni, you know, we are free to use. So we, we spend a lot of time creating a business model that will remove the economic burden and pressure from the actual end user um, and place it, couch it somewhere else. And we got a pushback initially from our investors who were like, well, look, if you're offering secure bike parking, let people pay $70 a month for it. And, you know, that's just not realistic. It's not really politically realistic. It's not morally realistic. It's not economically realistic. Um, but, you know, it is also just not going to produce the kind of change that we need. So I'm, I'm proud to say that 60% of our user base, just like New York, is non-white. 25% um, plus are below area median income. One out of every... I think seven are working cyclists. Um, and that's a big part of our of our pie chart for success. How we can go to communities and say, look, we're not just building concierge luxury amenities. We're building real blue collar infrastructure that you're actually going to use. If you live in a, you know, in a, in a nice luxury condo in Manhattan, you probably have access to a bike room. If you live, if you work at Google, you probably have access to a bike room. But most New Yorkers don't live in luxury condos. Most New Yorkers don't work for Google. If you live in Crown Heights, where I live, or East New York, you probably live in an old pre-war building um, that doesn't have a bike room. Um, you don't have access to safe, secure bike parking. You live in a brownstone. You have to carry your bike up the stairs. you got to sleep next to your bike. Um, that's not going to be something that is um, realistic for you. And so the conversation about cycling is as much about race and class and privilege um, as is the conversation uh, about you know, policing or as is the conversation about incarceration transportation is the next issue that intersects with every other issue. We have to get increasingly comfortable talking about, you know, all the interconnection points um, that, that we touch. Yeah. Yeah. Here, here. And it also re reminds me too, that uh, when we look at uh, other cities across uh, North America and many other cities globally, uh, the invisible cyclists, you know, the the people who are riding, uh, you know, oftentimes very very late at night or early, you know, mornings to be able to get to their jobs, uh, and you know, they're they're completely invisible because we just don't think of them. The advocacy organizations, you know, aren't you know really, you know, looking at those those individuals, and yet they are disproportionately. A uh, higher representation of the fatalities and the, the crashes that happen frequently. They're on, you know, very, very cheap 
second and third hand bikes uh, with, you know, no lights and oftentimes riding in uh, areas where there's no safe uh, facilities for them to ride. So, yeah. We, we, even worse, we erase them. You know, yeah, exactly. for, you know a, 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 I'll give you two examples. A major, um, you know, mobility company, um, scooter company, um, proudly released, announced that they were um, 17% um, Black and Latinx adoption. Um, and that, for me, as, as a black man, um, my, I experienced that as, as horrifying because, you know, when you're operating in markets like Oakland or Atlanta or Washington, D.C. that are majority um, black and brown, um, that's awful. Uh, you know, <laughs> you know, and then that, so, so, you know, that, that's, that's not efficacious, but um, it means that the communities that you're operating in are not this infrastructure valuable and people in the one and I know in Carmen Heights it, it, no one's riding five dollars to go to pay five dollars to go two miles on a regular basis. Um, but but also you know closer to home for me here in New York, you know, we release a report every year called Cycling in the City. Um, we being the, 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 the New York City DOT, which is you know of course um, a sub agency of the city of New York. And never once has that report you know, included real estate for delivery workers. Um, yet alone, you know, that, that's one thing. There's no paid delivery, there's no section, they're not even counted, right? They're not included in the formula. But never once have delivery workers even been included in the stock photos. They don't exist, right? And delivery workers are probably a plurality. You know, there are more delivery workers than they are city by trips in a day, right? Here in New York. So let's that, sink in. You know, City Bike receives all its attention. It's a great, extremely successful program, but there are more delivery workers in City Bike trips. City delivery workers save countless car trips, I mean, hundreds of thousands of car trips a day, right? They are the bread and butter of New York, quite literally. They feed the city. They represent the very best of us, right? These are immigrants who are working long hours in dangerous conditions. They get robbed, they get murdered, um, they get killed by trucks on the street. And we pretend, in exchange for all of that, we pretend like they don't exist. And then we go to them and say, hey, you know, can we have a vote? Can we talk to your local representative official about why bike infrastructure is so important to you? You know, we haven't talked to you or engaged with you for years. We don't like to, you know, really acknowledge that you're part of a coalition or you care about this stuff. But now can you help us out with organizing? That, no, that, that's not, like, no, that's not going to work. They ain't buying it, right? And... We have got to be able to go into those communities and to recognize and step back when we need to. I say this as a man, you know, and say, look, like, you, let's listen to what you want to do. Let's let you lead and we'll support you and we'll have your back and you'll be part of this tent that we're building. It's going to change what our cities look like for the better. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. Uh, for our parting uh, couple of images here, I brought uh, the mini back up, and we'll we'll scroll over and and look at the the original the pod, the pod better looking version of me. There you go, <laughs> a couple of years ago. Hey, Shabazz, thank you so very much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And you know, look, if you want to have another conversation, I'm always want to bring the gospel wherever you know we go, whoever is willing to listen. Well, hey, let's uh, let's get you back on uh, when you uh, get that major expansion, and uh, let, let's uh, let's tentatively say we need bring on your tenth city. We're gonna have you back on, <laughs> and that's gonna be pretty soon. From your lips to God's ears, my friend. Thank you also very much for tuning in to this episode of Shabazz. With bike theft rising to all-time highs, secure bike parking is an increasingly critical factor in encouraging more people to ride more often. I hope you found this conversation as interesting and inspiring as I did. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, share it with a friend, and leave a comment below. Now, if you'd like more content like this each week, please be sure to hit the subscribe button and ring that notifications bell. And finally, there are two additional ways you can directly support my efforts to produce this culture of activity content. The first is to check out my new Active Towns store for some silly and serious <laughs> Streets are for people merchandise. And the second is to come join the growing band of merry patrons on my Patreon account, where you can choose a monthly contribution amount that you feel matches the value I'm delivering to you. Seriously, the contributions currently range from a dollar per month to 25. 
And any amount is greatly appreciated. And heck, it's how I keep the lights on and the cameras rolling. Both of these links are below in the description and in the show notes, or just navigate over to my website at activetowns.org. Well, that's all for this week. So until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. <laughs>